Can you all hear me? Yes? I realized I never answered when anyone asked that, so I don't know why I expected you guys to answer. Um, so I'm thrilled to be back here again in Santa Cruz. I uh, always enjoy coming here. I'm really glad after that last talk I changed, <laughs> changed my title to reflect the fact that I'm talking about cosmological simulations, uh, as you'll see. But I'm, I'm really excited to come talk about my favorite topic, uh, dwarf galaxies. And in particular, um, I wanted to talk about the missing satellites problem. Now, if you guys are tired of hearing about the missing satellites problem, well, you're not alone, because I once heard Carlos Frank say, if he had heard anyone ever talk about it again, he would leave the room. Uh, so don't worry, though. I'm not going to talk about that missing satellites problem. I'm going to talk about my missing satellites problem from last year. And from those of you that were here, you might recall, I had noticed this surprising, concerning, or something I was interested in, um, lack of ultra-faint satellites around uh, isolated dwarf steroidal simulations uh, run with FIRE-2 when compared to FIRE-1. So I'm part of the FIRE collaboration. These are standard resolution uh, cosmological zoom-in simulations. And in only, at that time, there were only three dwarfs had been run with um, FIRE-1 and FIRE-2. And in every single case, in FIRE-1, they had an ultra-faint satellite, and they did not in FIRE-2. Uh, so here are two more slides from last year. And as you can see, I was really trying to figure out what's going on. It was concerning. I had a list of all the different changes that we made in FIRE 2. And I had some ideas up here about what was the issue. Because it didn't really seem to be affecting anyone else in the collaboration, any other objects. The only thing that seemed to be missing was uh, the ultra-faint satellites. So I'm happy to come back a year later <laughs> uh, and report that the case has been cracked. And it is related to cooling tables. So I'll go over this briefly. But basically, in addition, when we updated the cooling tables in FIRE-2, we added in a little bit of additional heating physics that had to factor in, such as photoelectric heating, cosmic ray heating. Now, uh, the FIRE collaboration is doing a suite of uh, simulations where we handle cosmic ray heating explicitly. But in our fiducial simulations, it's a subgrid approximation. And it just so happens that that subgrid approximation didn't exactly extrapolate perfectly well to high redshift, which caused just the teensiest, teensiest bit of extraneous heating at extremely high redshift. We're talking redshift 100 to 30, heating the IGM to maybe just a few hundred, maybe tops a 1,000 uh, Kelvin. So it only affected objects that had variable velocities of just a few kilometers per second. And so we've now gone back, we've checked everything, and it just so happens that it really didn't affect a single thing except for ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. But what it does mean is, That's right, the dwarf, the ultra-phase satellite galaxies are back. So this, again, this is standard resolution that I'm talking about for now. Here you can see the version without the cosmic ray fix that I showed last year. It's really just a sad, empty subhalos there. And here you can see, I'll even zoom in so you can see how beautiful, oops, well, <laughs> you see how beautiful it is. Um, you can see the ultra-phase satellites have returned. It's even more stark when you look at the stellar mass halo mass relation. Again, this is standard resolution. This is without the fix. It's just, I mean, we had one galaxy. And these are not just satellites. These are all galaxies, uncontaminated halos in the high resolution region. With the fix, oh, that's much more satisfying. We're getting, once again, many, many tiny galaxies. Uh-oh, I don't want that sound. I think I have to stay away from over there, right? OK. Um, OK, so part of why I cared about this is that in 2015, I used the original version of FIRE to make a prediction uh, that ultra-faint galaxies should exist as satellites of isolated local group dorsoroidals. Uh, and at FIRE-1, which it was the exact same resolution as our standard dwarf resolution, so these galaxies, as cool as they were, ended up being as low uh, star particle count as 16 star particles. If you, oh, let's go ahead and put that line on here. OK, so this is FIRE-2. Now you can see, uh, again, the satellites. This is our standard resolution. So everything I've been talking about is a baryonic particle mass of 250 solar masses um, and a force resolution of a parsec. Now, I didn't come here today to just talk about that. If you saw my title or if you remember my talk last year, remember that we're pushing this uh, to the max, or at least close to the max as we can in a cosmological simulation. 
So what I've started calling the super duper high res simulations now have a baryonic particle mass of 30 solar masses. Now, I didn't want to necessarily get into it too much, uh, but because of the last talk, I will say, what we do is we have a single star particle, we stochastically sample the IMF, we don't actually change the mass of the particle, but we handle all of the properties, like each star has a um, uh, number of O stars, like an integer number of O stars, and we handle feedback based on that O star number. Um, so it's not perfect, um, but it, 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 uh, it averages out uh, in the end. Okay. So now we can, solve, we can resolve these same ultrafaints, the same stellar mass cut of about 3,000 solar masses, now with 100 or more stellar particles, which I think is much more interesting and um, going to be much more easy to believe, at least some of these results. In addition, this is the first time in a cosmological simulation where we've had the force resolution to resolve the cooling radii of individual supernova. Right? This is significant. A lot of the changes that have gone into fire and a lot of the other simulations in recent years have had to do with just this. How do we deal with the fact that we can't resolve the set off Taylor phase of expansion of a supernova? So this, uh, of course, fire two was tested uh, at this resolution, but this is the first time it's been done cosmologically. Uh, so let's see. Um, here's the stellar mass halo mass relation for um, everything so this is everything in the high resolution region that has 100 star particles or more. The only exception is M10Q. M10Q got a little obsessed with three star particles wandering around in the center. Uh, so we had to restart it. Um, but everything else is at res 30. And I have my 2015 uh, points on there just for comparison, some abundance matching. And if I want to throw on the low resolution version, we can see nothing's going completely crazy, right? We've resolved this cool, these cooling radii and things still seem uh, pretty good. And I should point out that we, we form a uh, resolved galaxy in every single dark matter halo with a virial mass or greater than uh, 5 times 10 to the 8. has 100 star particles or more, which, as we just heard from Tyler, and I think which James will speak about after the break, uh, could be an issue. Um, and then I should just point out that only one satellite, in the purest sense of the word, makes our uh, star particle count. Uh, at some point, I'll probably investigate less, fewer star particles and look at satellites. But most of these things are centrals. OK, uh, I also am proud to report I have a very special treat, uh, thanks to Shay. Shay has, was uh, gracious enough to make a mock false color image of this dwarf and uh, some of its substructure so we can kind of get a qualitative idea of what it would look like. So it's the first time it's ever been shown. Uh, you guys ready? <laughs> oh, I don't know what you guys expected. Come on, it's a dwarf galaxy here. These things are hard to see. They have low, low surface brightnesses. Uh, you can see here in the mass size relation, the half, half mass radius versus stellar mass. I've got classical dwarfs on here, DES results year one and two. And um, you know, even though some of these objects are currently visible, this is about 30 magnitudes per square arc second, 32.5. This is probably where Sloan limit is. This is where we might reach by LSST. And if you think about it, the, basically these things in the field might be ubiquitous, but it's, there's also a chance that uh, we may not see them for, for quite some time. There's also, uh, it's not a satellite, but there's, an, there's one of the ultrafaints. It's almost a satellite uh, on the screen. Can anyone see it? James? I think James can see it. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, James. And just to help you guys along, it's a lot easier to see in go. gas. <laughs> uh, and just, you know, this, this is just kind of a pretty picture, again, made by Shea. Just really look at that structure. This is, you know, this only forms 10 to the 5 uh, solar masses of stars. OK, another prediction um, I made in 2015 that we can now check with actually really resolved uh, star or galaxies is uh, star formation histories. So um, I predicted that everything, I always think it was in a, everything in a dark matter halo mass of less than a few times 10 to the 9 would have uniformly ancient stellar populations. So if we play this game where we split up our galaxies, oh, there it goes again, into ultra faints on this side of the line and door swirls on the right, we look at the star formation histories, voila, prediction confirmed, this time with far more star particles. And this time, remember, there's only one satellite in here. These are all, um, for the most part, centrals. So it has nothing to do with their infall um, and probably everything to do with reionization. Um, okay, 
And then, oh yeah, another cool thing we can do, I think, say for the first time cosmologically, cosmologically, is look at the extremely low mass end of the mass metallicity relation. This is data from Kirby et al. and Vargas et al. showing uh, Milky Way and M31 uh, dwarf, uh, dwarf galaxies. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, this really looks like a flattening, I will say. Uh, but what Kirby et al. do is they neglect segue two here, and they do fit a straight line to it, which agrees with higher mass estimates. But if we put our simulations on here, well, we'll see a kind of a problem. Uh, part of the problem was known before, so again, this is, every time I say first time this and all that, just think cosmological and to redshift of zero, okay? Just throw that in there for my caveats. So these, these are the more massive objects, and this offset is understood, right? This is, uh, you can read a little bit more about it in uh, Ivana Escala's recent paper. I believe Andrew is working on something for the future, but basically it's our supernova type 1A delay time distribution. We might not have enough prompt 1As. It's not that big of an offset. It's the offset down here that is far more concerning or potentially concerning. If you believe these points, and I'm only saying that because Evan himself said he didn't necessarily believe these points, but let's just say if you believe these points, there's a huge offset here. Um, and it could signal, well, it could just be low number statistics. Actually, it'll only take a couple supernova to make up the difference. Or it could signal that we're missing physics, actual physics in the fire simulations, um, such as um, pre-enrichment of mini halos by population three stars, or it just could be because uh, the observations are all around a massive Milky Way or M31, where by necessity at this high resolution, we're not able yet to put a Milky Way or an M31 into the mix. So this, uh, this is all, it's all brand new stuff, by the way, so it uh, needs a little bit more uh, study. And then I just said everything is preliminary, but this is like extra preliminary preliminary. I just uh, got this from Andrew Pace. Um, uh, we looked at rotation of these objects, and we've confirmed previous results. You can see we looked at the rotation velocity divided by velo stellar. This is for stars. And this is unfortunately not a function of stellar mass yet, just particle number. So you can probably not trust this one and see that indeed, just like uh, with fire one simulations, which are these black points here, um, fire simulations don't rotate. So it remains to be seen still if we can reproduce the few uh, observed galaxies that do rotate. Okay, so in conclusion, um, this really happens every time. Um, okay, yeah, first time in cosmological simulations to redshift of zero. Uh, we're having ultra faints really resolved. Um, we resolve cooling radii, um, and the fact that not everything goes completely crazy. Uh, I had confirms, but now I'm going to just put lens credence to accuracy of the subgrid models. Now, after doing all, like looking at all these dwarf simulations, I've seen some crazy stuff. Tiny changes can make, can make drastic differences. And yet, some things appear to be robust. Uh, at least in the simulation, the fire simulations, we're forming ultrafaint galaxies and everything, uh, all dark matter halo is greater than five times 10 to the eight. They always have low surface brightness. They always have ancient stellar populations. And I did not have time to go over this. And also, the one object that forms a core is still running, so it wasn't really that interesting. But we have confirmed that in lower mass objects in fire, we, um, we're not forming cores. Two issues that remain to be uh, investigated. We still don't know if we can make rotating dwarfs. And the mass metallicity relation has huge offsets from observations, um, and so, yeah, I'll be looking into those things in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually a good question. I should check this with the uh, lower. We only do IMF sampling at this high resolution, but I haven't looked at. Uh, I've just kind of made this. But then again, we don't have those. Yeah, actually, James had said the very first thing we should do is just IMF average for 30 solar masses. I remember you said that. Maybe it would have been good to do that just to, to be able to test these things. Yeah, but we didn't do it, so I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's, we have the same IMF that we use to average over the higher, uh, the lower resolution simulations, and then it just keeps track of O number, and so, O star, o number, o star number, and so we stochastically sample the IMF, 
Oh no, I'm not going to be able to find. I have an extra slide, but I'll never find it. Um, so we basically stochastically sample, and then we treat the feedback from that particle as if it's a giant, massive star, which is a little weird, I understand, because sometimes it's having feedback greater than its mass, but yeah, that's the first way to do it. Eventually, I think we need to take two gas particles and smash them together and create a massive star, but that's for future work. Well, it wasn't that we weren't including cosmic rays. It's that when we did, when we did include them, uh, it was based on a, just a Milky Way background that slowly decreased uh, as, uh, with gas density. But it wasn't quite tuned to the fact that at super, super high redshift, the IGM can reach those densities. So it just, there was started, started to be a little bit of excess cosmic ray background before there ever should have been cosmic rays. Yo. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so there weren't cosmic rays in fire one, and at least from what I've seen, there aren't that many differences. So <laughs> I don't know that they're that, I mean, I'm sure they're important for some, yeah. Ah, great, and TK will talk about it. Yeah, no, that's Ivana Scala's paper, and we did, these are all run with turbulent metal diffusion. Yeah, and as is standard now in all fire. <laughs> no. Related to that, you said one possible solution is allowing a mechanic to be a metal floor, but isn't there already a metal floor in place? Well, the metal floor is instead of accurately treating, uh, it's, it's kind of the subgrid approximation to what we might expect from uh, pre-enrichment by population three stars. and. That, that might not be working. There is a floor. I mean, you can see the floor. Uh, I think the floor. <laughs> Here's the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it used to be minus, well, yeah, four, you're right. It used to be minus four. Yeah, and now, now it's minus five. It's like the flattening. <laughs> Yeah, they're almost a kiloparsec. I had that plot somewhere. Oh yeah, I know where it is. Is it after? Oh, sorry. Okay, anyway, I can show you the mass size relation there. Yeah, almost a kiloparsec. These old, but the, the more massive ones, um, yeah, they're, I guess they're all right around a few hundred parsecs, half, half, half mass radius, radii. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And I, I don't have this figure, but the low res version actually of this one is, is a little bit higher. And I was, had been concerned in the 2015 paper that you can't really measure a half mass radius from 16 star particles. But as I said, these all have at least 100. So I think we can trust them a little bit more. Yeah, based on science by video, it's kind of all over the place. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. 